Hello, everyone. Welcome to Right Hive and to our resident editor panel. We're going to be talking about understanding character motivations. Um, I guess, Jenny, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm a freelance novel editor. I'm a co-founding editor um, for Revise and Resubmit, that's hashtag Ref Pit on Twitter. And um, I live near Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm kind of a, a cat lady. I think that's the most interesting stuff about me. Hi, I'm Carly Hayward. I am also a developmental novel editor. And ooh, what's interesting about me? Um, I do hashtag RevPit as well. Jenny and I also have a podcast called Story Chat Radio, as well as the podcast we do with Right Hive called Wordner Cafe that the four of us are on. Um, I have some cats, but I'm not as much of a cat lady. <laughs> so I like to draw. There, there, there's my one special thing separate from Jenny. Uh, I'm Megan. I am a literary agent at DeForio Literary. I also edit books. Aside from the agent and gig, I've worked with Jenny and Carly in the Rev Pit world, which is super exciting. Um, aside from all that, I do not have cats. I have a very uh, what's the right word for energetic pit bull mix who will probably barge in at some point because she will stand on the edge of this chair that I'm on right now and decide to interject. So um, we'll let her have some thoughts at the end of this, but that's kind of me in a nutshell. She'll be our Here special guest. There you yeah. go. We will. She a special will. guest. Exactly. And I am Justine Manzano. I am a YA author and a freelance editor and um I've worked with Writer in Motion. I've worked with Query Connection. And of course, uh, we're all, all of us here are the um, resident editors at Right Hive. And I also have many cats. <laughs> it's a thing, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> really, only Megan doesn't. And it's a little suspicious. It's because she she's like trying to be different, you know? <laughs> Like that's her way of differentiating herself. Okay, I well, mean, fair. The, the the logical answer to why I don't have cats because my partner is very allergic to cats. Um, my personal reason is I'm a dog over cat person. Um, but that's like a separate issue, which we don't <laughs> need to get into right now. Right, that's like a whole other conversation. I feel like <laughs> we could is. get rid of character motivations and just discuss cats versus dogs. There we is could, that. and we can, and if we can, we can dive into each other's psyche if that's more entertaining for everybody. I mean, I was gonna say she already shares a last name with me, so she probably <laughs> needs to like differentiate herself <laughs> and the same glasses. I feel like same. this is the content that people have come here for. Yes, definitely. At least, don't have, Justine, at least you don't have the same hair anymore. That got really Yes, because <laughs> we used to, and then we just looked the same. Yeah. <laughs> now I shaved my head, so it's fine. I'll, I'll keep with the same look so that we don't, like, get confused for each other again. Good plan. Good plan. <laughs> should we talk about character motivations, though? We probably should. All right, so I guess uh, let's talk about character motivations and what they are and um, how they're different from goals in stories. Yeah, I think um, I think it's important just to start out with, like, let's talk about what, what are character motivations, right? Like, I mean, it seems maybe a little self-explanatory, but everything that we do as people, we have some motivation behind, right? So like, we sometimes the motivations are really obvious, like we're hungry, so we go get food to eat. Um, those kinds of motivations are not super interesting in the context of a book. Um, so when we talk about character motivations, we're usually talking about like their deeper inner motivations. There certainly are both internal and external motivations. Um, but we want to make sure that we are kind of covering all of those bases in terms of understanding what a character desires, what they really need, um, and just really what drives them in the choices that they make in the course of a story. Yeah, it's kind of like figuring out why Megan prefers dogs over cats <laughs> and what <laughs> cat hurt her <laughs> in the past. Literally no cat hurt me, okay? <laughs> Are you sure my cat didn't hurt you? Because that's possible. Yeah. No, they they went after uh, Julian instead. <laughs> uh, but I think I think the important thing is is 
also understanding how much of an impact that motivation is supposed to have on your character because your character needs to be moving towards a goal and those goals i think i feel like the difference between goals and and the motivations are that you know the goals are inspired by the motivations so why you know if a goal is i want this the motivation would be the why why do you want that um and i feel like every character needs that desire right we talk about that a lot in editing they need that one thing that they need um and so our motivation is why do they need that what about that thing is so important well and i think it just really i think it helps readers resonate um really engage with characters when we can have a clear understanding um on that, on that kind of deeper level of what drives them, what motivates them. So it's not just we're seeing their actions, you know, and that what they're doing maybe makes sense within the context, but it's also, we wanna understand why that particular character acts the way that they do. Um, and that really needs to have a basis in psychology is really what it comes down to. Like, you don't have to have like some kind of degree in psychology, but it just needs to have a real basis in understanding human nature, understanding how our brains work, um, how like thoughts and emotions work together and against each other, um, and how that um, then transforms into choices that we make and actions that we take. Um, and that really helps us create um, psychologically sound characters. So those are going to be characters that feel realistic, um, that we can either see part of ourselves in or see people we know, or at the very least, we can have a good, clear understanding of what's going on inside of them that makes them do what they do. Yeah. If you ever get the feedback that people don't understand your character, or aren't connecting with them, or don't get why they're doing what they're doing, it's usually that the motivation is lacking and that you need to really show where they're coming from and why they're making the choices that they're making. And that all comes down to the motivation. Megan, what do you think? All of you are doing so great. I'm so proud of all of you. <laughs> so I think it's also important to remember that not just your main character needs a clear motivation. All of your characters need motivations. Everyone has something that they want and a reason that they want it. And I think that's usually when I get caught up with like the antagonist. Mm -hmm. And if the antagonist doesn't feel real, like why do they actually want to take over the world or hurt your main character or any other thing? It has to feel real. I kind of, I want to relate to the villain or the antagonist, even if I hate them. Yeah, I think that's fair. And um, secondary characters can be like that too. I tend to think of like a sidekick type of character. So, um, you know, we, we want to think of them more as allies. Um, and a sidekick really feels like they're only there to serve the main character. They don't really get anything out of their actions. There's no real motivation for them personally. Um, they're only there for the benefit of that main character. So in order to make a character who feels like a sidekick into like a fuller ally, um, they have to have their own motivations for what they're doing. They have to have their own goals independent of what the main character is doing. They have to have their own, you know, their own desires, their own um, reasons behind what they're doing. Um, so I think it's their own really stuff going on. Yeah, exactly. And I think in terms of any secondary character, um, whether they're protagonist or antagonist, feeling like they have their own life outside of the events of this plot is part of what makes someone feel real, you know, in, yeah. in a story, what makes a character feel real. Yeah. I just agree with you very much. No, I think I, when you were talking about, uh, well, when Carly mentioned the the idea of the antagonist, and I think it's so important to remember that in real life, every, every character or every person rather is the hero in their own story. Right. So each person from the, I mean, you don't have to like round these people out that well when you're writing, but every single person in the story from like the person, the, the waitress at the table that 
you sat at, you know, to the actual main character. Like every, the bit players, they all have their own things going on if we're talking about reality. So if you're trying to create an immersive experience, creating anybody who feels like a cardboard cutout um, just kind of takes you out of it. So it's fun to have pe different types of people and different um, attitudes and really just understanding those motivations and getting, you know, getting realistic people. And also it's just so much fun to have a, an evil character who you understand. Yeah. Um, because the, the problem I think in a lot of stuff is that you have these arch evil people in yeah. you know they're villains and they want to destroy the world and why like why yeah. you live here you know <laughs> like give me an understanding of what they're why they would want to do that yeah That's yeah how do they explain it to themselves how do they deem it worth it what happened that made them want to do such and such yeah um i don't know if any of you have you have any of you watched um crazy ex-girlfriend yeah, some of no, it when it first came on. I've seen so, like, scenes of it, but not yeah. the whole thing. There's one song where she realizes she's like the villain in her own story, and it's a whole song. And it's just every time anyone's like, everyone's the main character in their own story. I'm like, mm -hmm. sometimes you're the villain in your own story. <laughs> anyway, it's not helpful. Something we haven't touched on yet is how character motivation affects plot, mm -hmm. um, which I think might actually be the most important aspect of character motivation. Like all of this other stuff we've talked about in terms of like creating an immersive experience, the reader feeling connected, all of that stuff matters. But when it comes down to like the heart of a story is there's a character and then there's a thing that happens. And if you just have like some random person and some random thing that happens, that those two things are in no way connected and there's no meaningful significance there, then it, it's not gonna feel like a story that you're gonna wanna keep reading. Um, so what makes, I, I sometimes, um, sometimes I'll get manuscripts where it feels like um, it's more like a, a sequence of events over the passage of time, as opposed to like a, a cohesive story. And for me, what makes that difference is those character motivations need to be clear enough that we see why the characters take the actions that they take and then those actions have consequences that then push the story forward so you have yeah. this sort of chain of event chain reaction that happens over and over and over through the course of the plot where you've got your character something happens to them they react you know, and then that creates consequences that they then have to act on and you keep going like that. And that all comes down to how do they act because of their motivations? Yeah. And that's what makes um, any given story, like you can only have that story be told with that character in it because we all have different motivations. We would all make different choices um, throughout the course of the story. Yeah, I usually call that a cycle I think chain works too but I it's usually for me it's the cycle of like what is their emotional wound which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit how does that cause them to react to the plot what are what's the fallout of their reaction that leads to them needing to react again and it's just a circle and circle and circle circle around yeah I feel like when I think when you're talking is also the external uh the external versus the internal yeah. motivation so we're we're dealing with things that force the story forward versus their internal like interpersonal story and those things like all it's all a balance all of these little plot bits that or plot not plot um all of these little um things that we talk about elements that we talk about in revision they're all a balance. And so you have to find a way to make that everything work together. And a lot of stories, a lot of authors don't realize that how naturally they do this mm -hmm. um, until you mm -hmm. start picking it apart um, and, and telling them. But it, it's, it's about playing with a person versus their 
surroundings and their their situation versus a person and how they feel about themselves inside right and finding a way to marry that and make it a cohesive tale Mm -hmm. yeah I think it's also really important too to like not necessarily understand the character motivation from the beginning because obviously everyone kind of writes in a different way and has a different way of revising and sometimes you don't always know what your character is going to be like until you've written it and you're like okay this is how they're going to act um but I think one of the notes that I find often that happen when I'm reading or editing clients book is it's very obvious when like character motivation doesn't line up with what they're doing um like you can tell very quickly if something doesn't feel right I feel like it's one of my notes that if when I'm doing like developmental edits I'll be like okay if they're thinking xyz about the situation why are they doing this then you know um and even if the character doesn't quite know themselves like there needs to at least be some kind of tapping at it or foreshadowing or something to kind of signal what's going on you know um like if your character is like this super bubbly awesome person who's like you know who doesn't really think about their actions and just does stuff but then you know suddenly they're having this deep introspection before making a decision it's like all right well how did we get from here without a certain trajectory um so i you know i think it's really important to kind of figure out motivation as early as possible um because that's going to inform how they react to these external these external stakes and how it's gonna, they're going to react to conflict or what's going on or anything that happens to them i yeah, do like your point though point. that it's not always something that you figure out like you don't always know it at the beginning so a lot of times um really cementing those character motivations doesn't happen until after the first draft um this is not necessarily something that like you can plan for a hundred percent um, you know, you, especially if you are like a discovery writer or pantser, um, you know, some, some people just really can't do any planning before they get started. So you just have to kind of write your way into it. Um, and that's totally okay. It's totally okay. If you're not somebody who likes to plan everything out or planning things out, doesn't work for you. Um, just know then that that's something that you're going to have to look at when you get into the revision process. Yeah. And as somebody who does plan everything out, uh, be ready to, kind of shift with it because a lot of times you think you know and then you start writing the character and really getting into the story and you realize you have no idea and or you realize it's not what you thought it was or you don't you you realize that your original idea kind of sucked and now you have to shift it <laughs> and so you have to kind of even when you're you are we're, we're touching on all different topics right now but even when when you are sort of a uh, more of a plotter, you have to still be able to pant sometimes to figure your way out of a problem. So um, I, I I never really like to like rigidly say which one I am because mm -hmm. I kind of feel like I'm a, I'm a plotty pantser um, in some ways where I'll just sort of wing it when I get stuck and when the, the description I wrote for myself of what's supposed to happen in this chapter isn't working yeah. um, and just kind of go off in my own direction. But I think that with all of the things, I think we, we were talking about this in our voice podcast uh, for Word Nerd, um, but all of these things, they write your story and enjoy the writing process in draft one. And these things where you come back and you start analyzing what you've done and how you've done it, that can wait, that can yeah. wait. That's why there are revisions. That's why there are new drafts. You write, and I, I try to remember who is who it was that said it, but you tell yourself the story first. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what the first draft is. And yeah. then you figure out all of these little things that you have to tweak to make it a more cohesive story or more understandable to other people, more relatable. Um, that comes later. So never feel like you have to sit down and map everything out before you know you finish your first draft or before you start your first draft because you'll kind of drive yourself crazy. Um, just sort of write your way into it or write your write your way into understanding exactly where you're going. Sure. So. It might help, I think, if we kind of define um, internal versus external motivations and yes. conflict, if anyone wants to kind of take that. I'll get started with it. There we go. Um, I think, um, so I have a tendency, I think a very simplistic way to look at internal versus external has to do with, um, generally speaking, um, external is plot, um, like the things that happen outside of the main character. And then the internal is the character arc. So the things that happen inside them and their thoughts and feelings. Um, so external motivations, 
would be the thing like, I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go get something to eat. Um, obviously that's very simple, um, but it's, I think it's a good illustration of what an external um, goal and motivation would look like. So my goal is to eat something. My motivation is I'm hungry. Um, internal motivations then might come into play when I'm trying to figure out what to eat though. Um, because then I have to think about um, whether or not I'm eating something that's healthy and helping me work towards my goal of being healthier. That's an internal goal. That's an internal motivation. Um, it, I might have to think about price and that's something then that would play into other internal motivations. Um, so, so that is, you know, sort of the difference between my external goal, my external uh, motivation of meeting my external goal. Um, and then I have these internal goals and internal motivations, but they all work together, right? Like they all play into the choice of what I'm gonna eat for dinner. This is also my ADHD way of explaining why it is that I have such a hard time deciding what to eat. <laughs> Nobody can decide what to eat. That's a universal. <laughs> Especially now, Discuss dinner, for an is, hour. dinner is hard and <laughs> God, I have to cook every day. So anyways. Yeah. Um, I think kind of feeding off of that, one definition I kind of like going with for like internal conflict and motivation is your character versus themselves. Mm -hmm. So like, what are they fighting themselves? Like, or how are they fighting with themselves? I should say. So like when trying to figure out their, how much money to spend on dinner, why are they debating that in their head? What happened to them in the past that led them to be concerned about this? Why is it such a struggle for themselves right now? Why are they arguing with themselves internally is kind yeah. of how I think of it. Yeah, I, th I feel like you covered it. And sometimes I hate letting Jenny go first because then she ends up covering the worst. everything. And, um, and <laughs> I don't I know why like we do like it. Scramble for something to say. But See, I feel um, like I don't, I don't, it's not like, you, it's not like I'm like just dying to go first. You guys are like, who wants to go first? Let's all just sit here and stare at each other. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like talking first because I will, I will, I can and will monopolize the entire conversation. <laughs> what do you think about how do emotional wounds play into all of this? Justine, why don't you start us with that? Well, I feel like your emotion, the emotional wound of the character is the thing that makes them believe the lie right the yeah. the lie of the story and so i'm trying to think of a good example okay well this is a this is a good example and it's also plugging my book so i'm just gonna go with it um <laughs> <laughs> so i've got my book never say never coming out in june and the story is about a girl a girl who does not want to to date she doesn't want to fall in love uh she thinks love is bullshit and it's a made-up thing and there's no such thing. So, and that comes from her, the emotional wound of the fact that her parents are not in a happy marriage and have not really ever been happy. And so while she is sitting there fighting off the, the matchmaker who's trying to get her into a relationship, she internally, that's what's happening externally, but internally she's trying to decide what she believes. And if, if it's true that love is, not a real thing or is not permanent and is automatically destined to end in you know a horrible relationship and so that's where the the external of her friend trying to set her up everywhere is pushing on the internal art uh battle she's having as her parents struggle with their divorce Mm -hmm. um so that's I, I totally plugged my book but that is <laughs> my understanding of how the emotional wound can lead to your internal motivation and your, and, and can be affected by your external motivation. Yeah. So to me, the emotional wound is what happened in your character's past that has left a very strong mark on them that leads them to make decisions that maybe aren't in their best interest or don't necessarily make sense to everybody um but they do within the context of that wound so like your parents going through a divorce or any childhood trauma that you can possibly think of um it doesn't need to be that big but it's something that's left like a very lasting 
impression that causes your character to react a certain way to certain whenever you poke at that wound or bring up a thoroughly have to be a childhood yes exactly it definitely does not um those are just usually the extreme ones right right um yeah so like how can you you want to poke at that wound and with whatever you're poking at it with is going to cause a very strong reaction even just internally for your character that maybe doesn't make sense to everybody else well and so what it what it happens essentially is that they they have this experience um it can it's Typically we think of it as being like a one-time thing, but it's not always. It can be like a pattern of behavior that they've experienced. Um, but so it can be like we they experience this thing and they create, so they tell themselves something that they believe is true about the real world, the rest of the world, based on what they've experienced through this one very difficult time. And, and we do this all the time in real life as well. Again, this comes back to like real psychology. Um, anyone who's ever been in any kind of therapy knows a lot of therapy is just untangling all of that, you know? Um, so your, your character is not even always gonna know that that's what's going on. They think they're getting along fine. They think, you know, they're doing things in their best interest. They're trying to do what's best for them. And so the course of the events of the plot are going to push them to have to examine that. Um, So um, Justine, you mentioned the lie of the story. That that lie of the story is that thing that they believe because of this emotional wound that they carried with them. Um, I think some of the most interesting stories happen when the character themselves is not aware of their own emotional wound and they sort of discover it through the course of the story. It can still be very interesting though when they do know about it you know um it's it's not like because you know something is there you're fighting it any less you still have these conflicting um things that you want to accomplish so i think um emotional wounds are something that's really important i do recommend whenever you can knowing at least at the very least your character's emotional wound before you get started on a story even if you're not really a planner um, just knowing like what that is can help you make um, ha- make them ha- have like the right choice the right choices to make the story interesting. Yeah, yeah. The authentic choices. Authentic. That's a good word. Oh, and yeah. to make their um, their reactions and all of their arcs and stuff a little bit easier for you in revisions if you know that emotional wound beforehand. Um, and I'm gonna this is gonna be my my plug for this recording for mm-hmm. uh, the emotion thesaurus the emotional wound thesaurus yeah. it's not for writers um these are great resources for um anything that has to do with emotional wounds um jenny author- and i can't talk about any sort of anything related to books without plugging that it's really i true. just did the panel and plugged it <laughs> it's just yeah. the best book it really I just- is it really is and everything um, All of their resources are so fabulous. So I highly recommend checking them out. So how do we create realistic motivations that work in writing? (laughs) Ah, throwing the gauntlet, huh, Jenny? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, ultimately, I think what you said before about kind of starting out at least at the very concept of what the emotional wound might be or what your arc might be loosely, you know what I mean? I mean, I think... I think part of creating a realistic stake and, you know, realistic conflict kind of comes from two different parts. Like one is like just a craft element of understanding like how a story works and how much of like your character arc and internal stakes motivates everything else and is influenced by everything else. So I think fundamentally it's a craft level. Um, And then I think the other part of it is just kind of having an understanding too of like emotion and internalization affecting a person and affecting a storyline whether it's your own life or somebody else's you know like we all just don't make choices because we're just like we just like throw a dart at a board and we're like that sounds great let's go do it um there's layers of things that play into every single choice we make even if it's something like getting food or going for a walk or like why we choose a particular thing um and how you create I think a realistic character is going to vary very heavily on how you stru- like how you write and how you structure your own story. Um, 
like me personally, I tend to have like, I like, I, I'm, a, I'm a pantser when I write entirely. I can't plot anything. It's awful. Um, but well, like usually I have like this strong sort of pull towards a particular character and backstory that I want to tell from the very beginning. And then I kind of filter in everything else. Like I'm like, I know what this character is going to be. I have their trauma ready to go. We're going to do this. You know what I mean? Um, but that's like how I do it. Other people might not know how to do that off the bat. Um, but I think just ultimately, like, when you have the understanding of, like, an emotional arc and you have an understanding of how that's going to influence the story, like, I think it'll come in a bit more naturally, even if it takes refining through edits and having readers to do it, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really just, you start to learn it and hone in on it over time, and there's no right or wrong way to do it, especially depending on the character. It's just kind of how you're going to sh structure your own story and how you work on it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. I know some of the examples we gave was I'm hungry, so I'm eating or whatever. Um, what makes a motivation work is if it matters and it, it kind of, it needs to be a certain level of important. It can't just be, um, I'm going to come up with a really stupid, like I dropped a plant and now I can't ever grow plants ever again. It still it needs to matter. It needs to yeah. have stakes around it. Um, it needs to truly affect the life of your character, um, and be realistic and real. And even if it is sci-fi or fantasy or something crazy, it still needs to be comprehensible by your reader. Um, it's usually what makes sci-fi fantasy feel so engaging is very real emotional stakes and wounds that are relatable even in this um, completely different setting. Yeah I think part of that too part of the stakes is um, th that there would have to be consequences that would matter mm -hmm. you know so like what I have for lunch is boring and would not make a good story because it doesn't like even if I detail all of my thought processes and that's very relatable. It's not interesting. Like it's not, it doesn't really matter what I have for lunch and like the scheme of things. Uh, I feel like I'm like challenging somebody to write me a story about like why it's important what I have for lunch. Um, but so, yeah. So why, why what you had for lunch is important is because you don't normally have a choice what to eat for lunch because you were once poor and you were not able to afford certain types of food. And so having a, a large selection of food in front of you and choices do matter sure. in that way. It impacts your character and it shows, you know, it impacts how they go forward. However, it's not a whole story. So it doesn't right. impact the story so much though. Yeah, no, but it does it doesn't tell character. And does yes. it have consequences? Right. Um, the consequences don't necessarily have to be like life and death. You know, it doesn't mean if, you know, I pick the wrong thing for lunch, like the world is going to explode. That doesn't have to be the consequences. It just has to mean that it matters. Like this choice makes a difference, a real meaningful difference to this character. Um, so there certainly could be contexts where what you have for lunch is, you know, going to make a difference to a character. Um, but I think generally speaking, um, you know, you have to watch out for, you um, stakes that don't really matter in the scheme of things that they're not going to have any kind of meaningful impact um so that i just wanted to add that about stakes and yeah consequences. i agree and i think you mentioned too about it being um like you were saying about it being believable mm -hmm. um that we have to have um the motivations need to be believable um so um when megan was talking about um characters you know, acting differently in like consecutive scenes that they're sort of like in one scene, maybe they're like somebody who doesn't really think much about things. And then suddenly they're like overthinking this one decision. Um, that doesn't feel believable. That doesn't speak to what our experience is like in real life. Um, so we need to see consistency there for it to feel believable. We need it to be able to be something we can relate to our experiences in the real world for it to be believable. Um, and, and it needs to speak to that sort of, um, that chain or that cycle of, you know, action and consequences and reaction, um, 
in order to feel believable. Um, does anybody else have anything that contributes yeah. to being believable? <laughs> I wanna, uh, not so much, in, well, sort of the believability, but a slightly related tangent. Um, in terms of relatability too, I think that sometimes relatability also gets conflated with being likable. And that's not what it means by relatable. Um, I mean, relatable in the most blatant sense just means that we should be able to understand a character's motivation and empathize, not necessarily feel the same way or do the same things, but at least have a concrete understanding of why they're doing something, which gets into the whole thing of like antagonists and morally great characters, which are right. some of my favorite things. Um, but yeah, like uh, relatability doesn't mean that we have to like every single thing we're, they're doing or like completely be like, oh yeah, that's exactly how I do things. That sounds awesome. No, it's just a, a, a point of understanding and having those motivations clearly laid out um and even in like the most basic sense like even if you like hate a character right the the best thing for those characters that you don't like is there's one tiny thread that they will say or do or respond to and you go oh yeah I got that and you can kind of see where the other side of that argument or decision or logic goes even if it's an extreme logic even it's something you wouldn't do um, but relatable just means that you have this tiny little thread that you can pluck and be like, yes, I felt that before and I go with that. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to like them. But, you know, they're more fun if you kind of don't like them. That's a very good point. <laughs> my husband says, all my book boyfriends are guys I would never like actually date in real life. Um, <laughs> I get that. But, uh, but that's, I mean, that's 100% it. I mean, it's about about understanding why they do the things they do. You might not, not necessarily ever want to experience the same thing or react in the same way, but if you can, you have to, it's kind of like, okay, so it's kind of like when you're discussing with a person with a totally different viewpoint and you have to kind of be able to sit down and debate and see their side and relate to them and you're trying to get your point through and they have to like you you have to kind of when you're writing you have to put on that hat where you're going why would that person think that way like I don't understand and then like start unraveling why what led to that all of those steps those are writing steps it's like you step into I think it was who was it in the in the recent podcast somebody said it was like acting and I can't remember who it was but you put on the character's hat for the day mm -hmm. and you figure out what it is they would do and why through kind of viewing your own thoughts, but not choosing your own thoughts, just kind of be like, well, what, what would it be? What would it take to make the person do the opposite of this? Yeah. Or why would, and just kind of play with that. You don't have to even be writing anything. Play, play with that. Make that an exercise that you do to think about what, you know, what drives people to think in different ways and behave in different ways. Like, you know, as I, as I said before, you know, pick apart your friends, pick apart your, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then what, everyone needs me because. <laughs> what could possibly have happened to Megan in the past? Like Make dog. Like, yes. Yeah. Not like cats. Exactly. Yeah. If you, if you I mean, I'm saying this, I love dogs. Out. I laid this all out in bullet notes for y'all from my psychological history, but this is not what we're doing. You know? <laughs> What I'm I am just... hearing is that next time I get into an argument with somebody online, that the question mm -hmm. I need to be asking them is, who what hurt you? Yes. <laughs> Which what is, cat hurt what you is, in the What past? is the lie that you believe? <laughs> and why do you believe that? Oh my gosh. Okay. I dare you guys to do <laughs> that the next time you're arguing with, a, with an author. <laughs> You ever have to, if you ever, if you're ever debating something with another author, like ask them what their emotional wound is. I dare. <laughs> um, I don't debate with authors. They just always agree with me. I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not true. I, I agree with, I agree with editors a lot, except for, you know, Jenny. When um, they're editing her work, then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I think, I think too, um, so we talked a lot about internal and external motivations, but I think it, um, it bears repeating that you need both kinds of motivations. This is not an either or situation um, yes. that you need both kinds of motivations, both internal and external um, in any story, really. And this goes down really all the way to the picture book level. Um, how many words you spend on explaining that backstory or that um, motivation is something else entirely. 
Um, but you know, any, any story that you write, you need to have those motivations both internally and externally. And I also think it's worth mentioning that those motivations can change. And I've, I've read a lot of really good books where the characters internal motivations do change, um, or they can conflict. So, you know, we don't just have one motivation in life, right? Like there's not just one thing behind all of our actions. So I think um, some of the most interesting conflict comes from, we want more than one thing and we can't have both of them. Um, so how, how is that resolved? Um, I think can make a really interesting arc. That makes for very fun, complex characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, another thing you said about like how they can change, like their understanding of their emotional wound can change or their um, actions they take based on it can change as they get more input. So like you don't necessarily need to completely upend their um, internal conflict or motivation, you can kind of start to just steer it mm -hmm. with like, oh, they had this horrible thing happen. And because of that, they react a certain way. But as more influence is exerted on them, maybe they're starting to learn or grow or react in a different way or um, come at it from a different angle or understand it differently. And that all works towards building um, building your character arc. I mean, exactly. as, as they go through the plot and the external um, stuff that is happening to them, their plot and, and everything thrown at them, they slowly evolve into someone who deals with things differently, which I think is a great arc for a character when you yeah. start to see them, when you see those motivations change or you see the, their reactions change um, that means you're telling a good story. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, the and change story. doesn't always mean change for the better either. Exactly. Just yeah. As a note, they yeah. can get worse. Yeah. They can have a negative arc where they end up in a worse position than and, they were or in a further um, diving or like a doubling down on their internal wound. They can not learn good things. Well, and I, I think often, um, even just within the course of like a, a plot arc, we see that that does get worse. You know, we've got, you know, what a lot of people call like the dark night of the soul or, you know, the, the dark moment. moment, or it's called like a hundred different things, but it's basically the point at which the main character feels like giving up. Like they can't face down their inner demons. They can't face down their outer demons. They just aren't <laughs> cut out for this. They're just giving up. And that is um, a moment of change for them. You know, they, their motivations have changed, but they haven't quite caught up with being able to overcome that yet. Um, so I think, you know, if, if the motivations don't change at all over the course of the story, it can often end up feeling very um, flat and boring. So. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so anyone have anything else to say about character motivations? They're good. We lack They're them. They're good. They're fun. <laughs> we love them. We appreciate them. Show that character growth, you know, all that good stuff. Yep. Really, really poke those wounds and torture your characters. It's fun. Yes. <laughs> Let's see those. Let's see them grow. Grow. <laughs> yes. Really hurt your characters. It's important. <laughs> so I guess that means we should wrap up. I think yeah, so. I think I think so. Everything. so I think just because we're having fun with with the occasional uh, plugs, let's uh, just before we go uh, share our websites or ways to reach us, so that uh, you know people can reach out if they have any questions or anything. I mean, we'll be in the the live chat too, but yeah, 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 yeah. So we all have our channels here in the Right Hive Discord. Um, that you can ask us questions anytime there. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, um, usually one of those two places. Um, you can also find my, me on my website, um, which is jennychappelleeditorial.com. Um, my website's booklighteditorial.com. Um, my Instagram is also booklighteditorial, but you can find me on Twitter at from Carly. 
Um, you can find me on Twitter at Megan underscore Manzano. And my website is meg-edits.com, which has everything from how to query me to resources for writing and querying and submission and all that and everything you need. Does it have pictures of your dog though? It does not, but if you <laughs> if you follow me on Twitter, you will see them probably weekly. So yeah. don't worry. Okay. She she made it appear. She like popped up in the very beginning when she got back from her walk, but she just like shoved her snout into my hand. But if you want to like <laughs> look on Twitter, you can find her. I'm pretty sure I posted something yesterday. <laughs> I saw her walking behind you at one point, and I was like, "Why aren't you coming to say hi to nah, us?" she wasn't. She wasn't interested in that. She wanted her food. Yeah, I don't blame her. Um, that's fair. Yeah. What was her motivation? Yeah. Her motivation was food. Her, her main motivation, let's be real. <laughs> Isn't it everyone's main motivation? So I am Justine Manzano, and you can find me at Twitter and Instagram and probably most other social media at Justine underscore Manzano. Um, and I'm on JustineManzano.com for my website where you can find stuff about my books and stuff about my editing and, um, you know, any other information you may need. Um and uh, I guess you should also visit righthive.org and um, come and hang out with us in the Discord. We all, we talk yeah. about things. I, I lead occasional classes. Jenny does. Uh, uh, whatever things that Jenny sorry. does. You know, she, whatever Jenny does. Whatever she does. Jenny does. <laughs> and um, yeah, so come hang out with us at righthive.org or at, at the Discord channel. And um, I guess that's it. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us for our panel. Bye. Bye. Bye.